Welcome everyone to tonight's webinar about best practice predator management. My name is Jo Cameron. I'm the Regional Manager for the South West Victorian Meat and Wool Team from Agriculture Victoria. Tonight's webinar is proudly supported by Best Wool, Best Lamb. Best Wool, Best Lamb is a partnership between Agriculture Victoria and Australian Wool Innovation Limited which provides a network for facilitating information exchange, enabling producers to implement improvements in key aspects of their business. Our presenter, Greg Misford, will be using a PowerPoint presentation during tonight's uh, seminar. Everyone has been sent an email with a PDF copy of that presentation. If you are with us tonight using your phone, you will need that in order to follow the presentation and Greg will let you know what slide number we're on. For those of you using the webinar platform, the present presentation will appear in your browser. After the presentation, we would be grateful if you could complete a short survey um, as to ensure that we're providing you with the right information at the right time in the right way. After the seminar, you'll be redirected to the survey. For those of you joining us via phone, you will be sent a link to a survey via email We'd appreciate it if you could, could complete that tonight, after the seminar or tomorrow morning while the event, event is uh, still fresh in your mind. This seminar is hosted and managed tonight by Redback Conferencing. Our Redback operator tonight is Jordan and he is here to ensure the seminar runs smoothly. There will be an opportunity to ask questions after the presentation and this will be managed by our Redback assistant Luke. If you are participating tonight on the webinar platform, you can type your question into the questions tab on the screen, which is a dark blue hand icon on the right hand side of your screen. If you are joining us tonight by phone, Luke will provide some uh, instructions later on how to get your question in the queue. So tonight's agenda. Greg Mifford, the National Wild Dog Management Coordinator from the Centre of Invasive Species Solutions will give us an overview of predator ecology and best practice techniques for management within farming enterprises. Greg has extensive knowledge working with farmers and com communities on collaborative approaches to the management of predators and dealing with their impact on businesses and communities. I'd like to thank Greg for his involvement tonight. I'll now hand over to Greg to continue with the presentation. Over to you, Greg. Thank you, Jo. Uh, look, first I'd just like to acknowledge, I guess, the uh, industry groups that fund my, my national position. You've probably seen most of those at the bottom of the screen, but AWI, uh, MLA, uh, Wool Producers Australia, Sheep Producers Australia, Cattle Council also chip in, and Animal Health Australia uh, also funds the project. So they've kindly provided the funds to allow me to conduct this work in a, a role nationally to assist landholder groups managing predators from around the country. Um, but tonight I'll move on to uh, the next slide in a minute, but we'll be talking primarily about uh, managing foxes in Victorian landscapes. I'll also cover off a little bit on wild dog management, but um, wild dogs uh, require a bit different management than foxes. Uh, foxes primarily impact on certain stages of, of lamb production, primarily at, at, at reproductive stages and lambing, whereas dogs, which is why they so, uh, have such a huge impact on sheep production particularly, is that they will have impact on all age groups and all classes of sheep from, from lambs through to ewes to wethers to rams. So their management requires uh, much more intensive long-term management than foxes. Uh, foxes can be managed to limit impacts to the, the assets that you're trying to protect, which in this case is probably lands, um, at certain periods within your annual uh, property management plans, but also in terms to the, of their ecology. So if we move to slide number two, um, it's probably nothing new to most of you, but foxes arrived in Victoria back in uh, the 1850s. Um, I grew up in Balan, just outside of Ballarat, and uh, these things were introduced down near Werribee and they spread fairly quickly across the country and, and now occupy 70% of the place. They spread very fast on the back of the rabbit movements across the country uh, back in the early 1900s and um, I found basically just about every landscape except for the arid north uh, and tropical north of the country where the climate conditions are probably 
uh, far too difficult for them to exist. Uh, their impacts are varied, um, but estimates nationally on the environment, impact to the environment and the economy, it's around $227 million, but that's probably fairly conservative based on the economic models that are used. Um, and as is pretty well known, foxes are also implicated in some of the major declines of our, our native species, particularly mammals and other small insects, uh, reptiles and birds. Um, they're primarily carnivorous, but they also are very effective scavengers and, and feed on a range of carrion and also rubbish, which gives them a propensity to be, to be managed through our baiting programs. They breed once a year, um, primarily between June and October, depending on what part of the country you are in. Um, but juvenile dispersal occurs in late spring and continues until the next breeding season. And it's at that time that we can target control to some of um, to target some of those juvenile animals moving through the landscape. And their dispersal, unlike dogs, which are, can be quite extensive, um, dispersal in foxes is usually relatively small and, and less than 50 kilometres. Um, but it is dependent on the population densities in that location and also is highly dependent on how much food's around. So the uh, more greater food availability, the more foxes it can support, the less need there is to move. So um, once again, it's all highly variable and um, we'll talk about that as we move forward. So progressing on the stage to slide three. Fox densities, um, I've had to adjust the, the red lot, I used to have another terminology there but I'll, I went with could be a lot more out there than you think. Um, the average density for foxes in Australia in most landscapes is around four per square kilometre. Um, that can increase as I said earlier up to, uh, we've had some estimates at around seven per kilometre for areas around Orange in New South Wales, but if we work on the average of four per kilometre, um, in a, a circle that's a two, two kilometre radius around that homestead in the green there, for instance, which is 13 square kilometres, we're looking at around 50 foxes. Um, if you increase the diameter of that circle to three kilometres, which increases your area to 76 kilometres, you're looking at around 312 foxes. And if you go out further to um, 10 k's away, um, you're looking at densities in around, up and around 1,250 per square kilometre. So from a management perspective, that means that you know, we have to put out enough control to manage at least four, four foxes per K. Um, and if you haven't got an extensive coordinated program around you, then we need to look at sustained control to manage foxes that might move back into your property after you undertake your control program. So moving on to slide four, um, impacts. You know, apart from the the in-your-face lamb survival issue and, and primary predation, um, attacks on live lambs and, and to a lesser extent adult sheep in, in foxes. But we're also seeing um, considerable amounts of disease being spread uh, as well as parasites in some populations uh, which impact on reproductive success and youth health. So there's some of the lesser known um, impacts. But from my experience and working with collaborative groups of growers around the country, there's also, I think, a, a range of lesser known secondary impacts that we're working with AWI and, and MLA through Best for West Lamb to try and investigate. And those are the increased risks of mismothering um, from stress um, after landing from high predator numbers and activity. Um, as we know, merino ewes aren't the best at mothering up at the best of times and they're even worse when we've got twins on the ground. So any additional stress in the paddock from high numbers of foxes floating around looking for a cheap feed um, or the odd wild dog floating around or even pigs in some of our northern areas could be enough just to cause that uh, mismothering of that extra land um, which was, is always going to end up reducing our uh, reproductive success and our weaning rates. We also see in some places the you know, continual harassment of, of your flock by uh, particularly wild dogs but also pigs can cause reduced fleece weights and, and affect growth weights, particularly if you've got lambs and you're trying to put weight on for sale. Um, and we also see in some locations where some of these predators like foxes and particularly dogs in, in arid environments where they take up residence on a water point uh, can greatly affect the, um, the grazing movements of your stock and, and force your um, sheep and, and other livestock into areas of the paddock that are potentially less um, productive and, and you know, lack of water also affects their um, their growth rates and reproductive output. So there's a range of lesser known impacts that um, we probably overlook, but 
I think in time we need to start looking more closely at what those effects might be. And so if we move on to pay, slide number five, uh, this pie graph has been um, developed by Sabine Schmalzi from CSIRO and it's based on some data there from Rashorgi et al. But it provides a pie graph of the various causes of land mortality that were detected through the um, AWI sentinel flocks and I think that's where Best Lamb and DPI of Victoria had a bit to do with these. And there's no surprises there that you know dystopia, um, stillborn, birth injuries um, cause considerable impacts on reproductive success. Primary predation from foxes in terms of killing live lambs equates to about 7% in these studies. However, in talking to people involved in those sentinel flock um, trials, some properties did experience up to 20% lamb mortality through primary predation. But because the, the data was collated over a number of years and then averaged out across those years, those figures came back to 7%. So annually, your losses through primary predation could be much higher, depending on the densities of foxes in that location. Also, will depend significantly on you um, condition, um, a land condition of birth and, and seasonal conditions. So it's something to take into account that, that it could be much higher than the industry standards currently um, predict. But the other factors I'd like to indicate is that additional 30% as a result of the starvation um, exposure and then there's another. And once again, this just highlights the potential for you know, high densities of foxes or predators in paddocks to be causing some of that mismothering that I talked about previously. Um, and then the secondary results being you know, the starvation or exposure uh, and death regardless. The, the pictures on the sides there, um, just trying to determine causes of death. Um, the top slide there, that lamb with his ears chewed off and, and tail chewed off is, is classic sort of external signs of, of fox predation. Um, but if you go to the extra level of opening the uh, carcass up and having a look inside, um, you can see in that middle one the, the lungs of a, a young lamb, the top lung is, is pink and has been aerated, so it's had oxygen pumping through the tissue and, and as such as likely to have been killed by a fox after it um, was active and, and um, you know, on the ground running around. Compared to the one below that, which is still dark, um, uh, hasn't had any blood really or air pumping through that tissue and has possibly been stillborn and then uh, chewed on as carrion by a fox. And then down below, it's probably a bit hard to see in the slide, depending on how big you've got it magnified, but you've got the intestines there with milk in the small intestine. So, you know, quite clearly shows that the animal's been alive, there's been suckling, it's probably suffered uh, a mortality as a cause of predation. So if we move through, I guess, in terms of what do we do, what are the current control techniques available to us, uh, if we move to page, uh, sorry, slide six. Our current control techniques haven't really changed a lot in the past 150, 200 years. We're, we're still using baits. Um, we're burying them and we've got a variety of baits available to us now compared to the good old days. Um, our shooting is probably one of the aspects that has you know, had some major technological advances from um, high-tech callers now compared to the old button whistles. We used to shoot foxes with the 22 with back in Berlin when I was a kid to um, you know, high intensity spotlights and now we're moving to this thermal imaging uh, scopes which allows us to pick up a lot of foxes that um, we don't generally see in a spotlight and from what I've been told for everyone you see in a spotlight there's possibly two or three out there that never look at the light. So um, these new technologies although expensive are providing us with additional options to to pick up those other foxes that we don't see when we're, we're out in the paddocks. Um, additionally on the next slide on seven you know, we've still got exclusion fencing. They're, they're much more high tech now than the old rabbit wire fences we used to have. Um, they're particularly effective for wild dogs, provided that we maintain their integrity. Um, they're reasonably effective for foxes, although foxes will climb, unlike dogs. And, and um, I've seen foxes back at home on, on a deer farm, you know, climb over an eight-foot fence. So, regardless of having fences in place, we still need to apply some form of control inside those fences to limit any. Um, foxes that might get through those defences. Uh, trapping, and I'm not going to talk a lot about fox trapping today because it is a fairly specialised discipline, but traps have changed significantly from the good old days of serrated jawed leg old traps and rabbit traps. Uh, we've moved further along the lines of um, the fur trade and 
internationally recognised and approved traps that are used in Europe and, and in North America. Um, they generally have rubber jaws on them, um, otherwise they're, they're offset, so there's a gap between the steel jaws so that we don't see them crushing the bones on the legs of animals. And they're generally a lot smaller, so rather than hit high up on a leg bone like the, the old uh, Lane's dog traps, they, they get the animal just above the foot and um, utilise the thickening of the foot and the, and the toes beneath that to uh, stop the feet coming out. So very effective, um, much more humane and um, at this point in time we've got uh, a lot more leeway with animal welfare groups in terms of their use. Um, we've also looked at guardian animals for a range of situations and, and landscapes and they all work to varying degrees for, for different species of predators depending on where you are uh, and how much effort you put in. Um, we see alpacas that I've seen used for, for foxes um, and can work quite effectively in small groups and small paddocks um, aren't so good for, for wild dogs and they tend to panic at the sight of more than one dog so uh, various success there. Um, guardian donkeys have been used in, in various places to reasonable effect. Um, once again there are some tricks and, and knacks about getting that to work. Um, one one donkey is usually all you need within a paddock. If you put any more than one donkey in there, they start to hang out together instead of keeping an eye on stock. So once again, it's not um, not fail safe. And then there's been a lot of press, I guess, about uh, guardian dogs and their use. And um, from my experience, they tend to be quite effective uh, with foxes, once again, in small paddocks. Um, they're quite reasonably effective in, with wild dogs in certain areas, but once again, uh, it varies significantly on the number of stocks, the size of the paddocks, the landscape. Um, the image that's there is from a sheep property in northwestern Queensland, used to be the, the northernmost sheep producer in the country up on at Hewenden on the Flinders Highway. As you can see, extremely open country, the dogs can see the, the sheep from one end of the paddock to the other uh, and can see any signs of, of uh, or threats of danger to wild dogs and are pretty quick to respond. But once we get into Victoria and in some of those areas where we've got broken country, uh, a lot of timber, we've got um, you know, undulating landscapes where sheep are moving around in smaller groups, it's much harder for them to manage uh, to protect all of those stocks. So once again, you know, varying degrees of success and, um, and the application has a, a fairly large impact on how they work. Uh, and then we've got canid test ejectors which are a relatively new tool that we've had registered in the last five years. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, about their advantages and, and how in the Victorian landscape um, they could be very useful. So moving on to slide eight. Um, in terms of developing a control program, there's some really key issues here that I want to sort of talk about, um, particularly uh, from a wild dog management perspective and a collaborative perspective, but being proactive instead of reactive is really the key. Uh, implementing control before predators have an impact is ultimately your best form of defence. Um, leaving control till after the foxes are in paddock or lambs are on the ground uh, really isn't going to be of any advantage to you. And, and once again, from a wild dog manager perspective, trying to manage them before they um, start killing is the key to the success of any program. Um, being targeted is extremely important. More is not necessarily better. And chucking out more baits for the sake of it um, isn't necessarily going to mean you're going to have a better outcome in terms of predator management and where you put those baits is going to have a, a fairly large um, impact on the consequences in terms of whether they get taken or not. And I'll talk a little bit more about that further in the presentation. From a fox management perspective, um, we know and, and research has shown that we need between five to ten baits per hundred hectares, um, depending on the density of foxes we've got. Um, and in most agri agricultural areas, that's probably the minimum. Once again, have to be careful about how close you place them. Um, if you place them too close, foxes can uh, and will pick up more than one bait and, and ten, uh, can hide another bait. Um, so you want to place them at least 250 metres apart so there's a fair bit of room between baits so they don't get to find too many in a short distance. Um, once again, effective management of both wild dogs and foxes um, requires the use of all forms of control. Um, and Primarily, if we can get the assistance and, and work together with our neighbouring properties, then um, that's going to have a significant benefit to our lambing 
And, you know, non-lethal control techniques like guardian animals might be part of your mix, um, depending on what suits your property management and depends on, um, you know, your, your production type and, and your location. So um, no form of control should be excluded, um, but I will say that no single form of control will manage a problem either. And shooting alone, I put this here because, you know, I'm an avid hunter, um, but, you know, all the properties where I hunt and shoot, um, we still get uh, you know problems with animals even after we shoot. So shooting alone is not the the, pro, the the golden bullet. There is no golden bullet, unfortunately, in pest management. So um, I'm here to talk about a range of tools that you can apply um, as part of an integrated program. Um, it is effective, and I will say this: that particularly with the new technology coming out, it's extremely effective for picking up those animals or those foxes that avoid your other forms of control. Um, but you, sh you should be aiming at using cost-effective techniques first, and baiting is one of those. Um, it's extremely effective and, and provides you with 24-hour control when you're not in the paddock with a the gun. There's still control in place. Um, and we need to be safe about working dogs and manage those risks, um, not just to your working dogs, but if you've got non-target animals, which in this case could even be the neighbour's dog. So following best practice, um, adhering to the... the um, Procedural guidelines for the use of 1080 baits and also just being careful with where you put traps or even where you're shooting to make sure that um, you know those risks are mitigated to the best of your uh, ability. And once again, monitoring. And we're not... I like to emphasise monitoring because it's not something we do a lot of. We, we monitor our weaning rates and we monitor land production. But keeping an eye on what your pest population is doing is going to have a, a significant impact on just how many lambs you get on the ground. And um, once again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we progress the presentation. So if we skip on to page, uh, sorry, slide nine. There's now a range of baits uh, and bait types available for fox management in particular. Um, I'd suggest to mix things up. I think some of the biggest mistakes we make with baiting programs is using the same product over and over again. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't like eating a, a chicken schnitzel five days a week when I'm at the pub. I like to mix it up a bit as well as a different beer off the tap. So mix up the baits, put some different stuff out there. Um, the bait manufacturers now with manufactured baits providing uh, a range of products. Um, you can see there there's the defox baits, which are a bit of a, a salami. They're a, a sausage type bait. Um, and that's made by Pax International. We've got animal control technologies that are producing uh, dry liver baits, they also got the traditional fox off baits. Uh, they're now doing um, dried meat baits with fox strength 1080 in it. Uh, we've also got fox shield, which is made out of um, carp, of all things. Um, but for those areas where you've got large numbers of carp in your tributaries and people fishing and chucking carcasses out on the banks all the time, um, you know, it could be a very effective um, bait to use at certain times of year when you've got foxes that are used to eating carrion and, and chewing on carp carcasses. Um, so from that perspective, you know, mix it up a little bit and um, we've also got a new boat on the market, um, that, well, a new uh, toxin on the market called PAP, it's Paramino Propiophenome. I'll have a little bit of a chat about that later. But once again, I can't um, highlight enough the, the necessity to follow guidelines and directions for use. Um, the significant pressure on 1080 there always has been, um, so we really need to make sure we use it properly and um, according to those directions so that we don't risk uh, you know, having access to it in the long term. So moving on to slide number 10, I included this because I wasn't sure whether, um, you know, how familiar people were with 1080 and, and where it comes from, why it's so valuable to um, us as a, as a nation, but um, there's a lot of pressure on 1080 and a, a lot of um, negative social media about it based on its use in America and also in New Zealand where they use it consistently for um, well, New Zealand for herbivore management. Um, at the dose rates that we require for uh, carnivore management here in Australia, there's virtually no native animals that we can impact with the stuff. Uh, it's a naturally occurring compound that, that occurs in native plants. There's about 39 or 39 species of plants all up around the country. That map there just indicates the, the distribution of where those plants occur. Um, it's a naturally occurring poison, so, nat so obviously it, it's eaten and broken down by bacteria and microorganisms in the soil. Um, it leaves no residual, doesn't persist in the environment, 
Uh, it breaks down to harmless compounds in water and um, importantly a lot of our native mammal species are, are naturally tolerant to a poison from years of evolving in Australia and chewing on leaves with this stuff. Um, but introduced predators like foxes, dogs and cats are extremely susceptible to it. So, um, you know, we're using, you know, six, six milligrams per kilogram is enough, um, you know, which is a tiny amount. And I think I did some figures in a, a reply to um, a question on notice, but across the nation we're lucky to use four grams of 1080 per hectare, um, you know, I think it's per square kilometre actually. But we use extremely low amounts for predator management in the country. Um, and the most susceptible, well, based on pen trials, the most susceptible um, native species to a 1080 bait is that spotted tail quoll there being held by the handsome gentleman in the, doing the presentation. Um, they're basically a, a marsupial, well, almost a version of a marsupial ferret for any of you guys that have ferrets as kids like I did, um, except they bite a shitload harder. So um, that's <laughs> me trying to keep my fingers away from the body end. But um, we've done numerous trials now throughout New South Wales with aerial baiting uh, and dog strength meat baits, which is um, six milligrams compared to four and a half milligrams for foxes. And we simply can't kill one, even when we know that they're eating the baits. And I've got a couple of links there to um, information sheets on the PestMart website for you to have a look at if you just want to go and have a look at um, just how these animals are impacted by 1080. Oh, sorry, how 1080 does an impact on our native fauna. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions later on about that if you like. But realistically, um, 1080 is the most target specific and environmentally sensitive toxin that we have available for pest management here in Australia. And if we lost it, um, both our agricultural and um, native landscape would suffer significantly. Um, but we've always got um, concerns with 1080 because it doesn't have an antidote. And as a consequence of that, um, the predecessor to the Centre for Invasive Species Solutions, the Invasive Animal CRC, worked with animal control technologies to develop a, uh, get a new poison registered. And if you move to page 11, um, that new poison is uh, Paramono propiofeno, but we call it PAT for short. It does have an antidote. Um, we call it Blue Healer. It's actually methylene blue. Um, but it must be administered by a vet. Um, however, it is still highly effective if you can get your domestic dog there quick enough. Um, the, ten, the PAP binds onto the red blood cells that carry oxygen, it prevents them from carrying oxygen and, and basically the animal slips into a, a coma or unconsciousness and um, if 80% of its blood is saturated with the toxin then the animal basically uh, falls asleep and dies. Um, the symptoms to death are very similar to carbon, carbon monoxide poisoning uh, in people uh, which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, so there's some of the advantages. The disadvantages, I guess, are the time to death is, is less than two hours. Um, it's available in manufactured baits and the ejected capsules, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but the two, two graphs that I've got there um, just show you in terms of animals will recover uh, from PAP if they don't ingest enough of it and it doesn't reach that 80% saturation level in their blood. And the graph on the right just shows the um, two different arcs between the one dropping down from the left down to the right hand corner is the oxygen levels in the bloodstream of a dog that's taken a bait with, with PAP and on the left hand side um, that is the increase in saturation of the blood cells. So at around two hours um, uh, your dog's basically going to have um, not enough oxygen in its system to keep it alive and it will pass away. Um, some of the symptoms though, unlike 1080, which show very few symptoms until a dog's basically, um, uh, you know, past any ability to, to recover it. Um, because the red blood cells are being bound, the, the colour of the tissue around their gums and their tongue changes quite significantly from, you know, that bright pink colour that we're used to and it sort of turns grey until it gets to a really dark grey colour when the animal's fully sort of... Um, bloodstream is saturated with the, the PAP. So if you've got a working dog, you know, it doesn't stop from dawn till dusk. Um, you've had a suspicion that he might have picked up a boat and he's looking to go to sleep on you when he's usually full of beans, um, you could take him to the vet and uh, hopefully have the poison reversed. I will say though, um, because this stuff has to be administered by a vet, we do have protocols in place and, and vets can 
access that from the Australian Veterinary Association, but you need to let your local vets know that you're using this product so that they can get the antidote uh, and have it in stock should there be an incident. Um, so please just keep that in mind that um, if you do intend on using this product and if you do have um, neighbouring properties where you, those dogs have been a pain and, and you know you think that could be a possibility, it's certainly worthwhile letting your vet know that you're using this product um, and put him onto either animal control technologies who provide uh, baits for PAP or put it straight onto the ABPMA, uh, sorry, the Australian Veterinary Association, um, so they can get the uh, procedural guidelines for administering the antidote and get some in stock. So that's just a quick rundown of, I guess, a couple of the toxins um, that we're using. And I just want to talk now about the strategies that we might employ using these baits and other tools to manage our fox numbers and um, manage our impacts. So we move to page uh, slide number 12. In terms of our baiting strategies, um, in terms of achieving you know, the best success, coordinated programs are definitely more effective. Um, particularly from a wild dog management perspective where we know dogs can travel large distances in, in very short periods of time. Uh, it's nothing in Queensland, for instance, to have dogs travelling up to 120 k's in a night or two. Um, and in Victoria, whilst the, the landscape in the, the northeast and east to Gippsland is it, much more uh, rugged, we still know that they can move 20 to 30 k's overnight pretty easily. So uh, working with your neighbours in a coordinated fashion and a blind control over a range of areas allows us to uh, have control in place when those dogs might move through your property. Um, similarly with foxes, well, I talked about the densities earlier. Um, so if you can work with your neighbours and reduce densities on properties over a larger area, uh, that means you've got a much greater opportunity to limit those impacts um, when you're trying to protect your, your lambs at lambing time. Um, I do understand though that you know having uh, grown up in Victoria with the number of landholders you've got around you, sometimes it's difficult to get all of your neighbours involved. Um, you know, as, as uh, you know, people have varying opinions on, on what to do and how to do it and um, I guess the benefit of my role and the fact we've got industry funded coordinators in um, the North East and Eastern Victoria, those guys provide um, support to community groups and, and allow um, those collaborative approaches to work effectively by going around and, and door knocking or talking to people and we hold a lot of field days over there to convince people to be part of something to get an outcome for the greater good. And, um, you know, I'd like to see that eventuate over in Victoria at some point in time. But um, we do know that, you know, if we can get effective coordinated management programs, we've got research that shows that, you know, you can increase your land production by up to 20%. Um, and once again, that, that's highly dependent on seasonal conditions and uh, fox densities, but um, that has been recorded in a, in a couple of trials. So um, from a management perspective, coordination is always good. Uh, ground baiting, though, Principles are still the same, targeting movement corridors, um, those include isolated bushland areas, um, drainage lines, uh, areas where you know foxes are always going to travel to get back to your property. So looking for those areas in advance and being proactive is important. Um, I've already mentioned the necessity for working collaboratively, but we also talk about a new tenure principles, which basically means getting rid of the boundaries. and. Um, an example of that would be the, the map here that I'm just showing you is an area just north of the border in um, Queensland from New South Wales. Uh, the green areas are, are national parks and state lands. Um, all of the white is private country. Um, if you want to narrow it down even further, you know, we've got individual boundaries there which are the lines that outline the properties. And most people you know, consider and think about pest management you know, on a business level and think about managing their pests within those boundaries on their property. But the reality is that um, if you move to slide 14, uh, pest animals think of the landscape like this. Um, they look for areas of um, uncontrolled bushland, they look for areas that have got plenty of cover so they can move to point A to point B uh, in you know, being concealed. They use drainage lines, they'll use um, windrows, uh, they'll use tree uh, plantations where they can. So. Um, we call it a new tenure um, approach basically because uh, get rid of the boundaries and, and in this case in fact that, that white line which is the, um, the border with New South Wales, I mean people weren't even talking to each other either side of that line to manage their wild dogs in this situation um, and 
those boundaries are basically just lines on maps. They're not preventing animals from moving uh, in any direction. So our control programs from a collaborative approach need to consider the, the whole landscape rather than uh, individual properties. So that's where we um, the term nil tenure approach has come from that we use consistently in our National Wild Dog Action Plan. But it really is about um, thinking about landscape level control rather than individual property levels or, or some other form of um, impediment like a boundary or a state, a state border. Um, so that's where we come from in terms of our um, approach in, in nil tenure approaches for dog control in particular. Um, if we move to the, the next one, unfortunately, as I said earlier, coordinated approaches, particularly with fox management in, in some of those regions, is, is more difficult to achieve. Um, so I think this is where these new tools and, and new approaches really come into their own. Um, seasonal asset protection, you know, I think in traditionally when I grew up back in Victoria, you know, fox control happened a week or two before lambing and, and it was one baiting um, period and, and we hope that we got all the foxes and we do a little bit of spotlighting in between and, and um, you know, hope to Christ that we got them all that were there and, and we'd have a good lambing. Um, I think we need to move past that and start to think about our asset protection as you know a, a six to eight week program leading up to lambing. Um, given the densities of foxes that we could have uh, around us and on adjoining properties, we need to get rid of the ones that are on your place and then you need to put control in place that allows us to manage those ones that come back on board. Um, I use the, the adage that you know with a single baiting program just before lambing, we get rid of the ones that you've got and then you suck in the 20 from next door just before the smorgasbord hits the ground. So if we start looking at a six to eight week period, we do a, a good a good baiting early on, get rid of them six weeks in advance, and we look at these seasonal um, or replacement baiting programs, which is effectively just putting baits in known or good strategic locations where foxes are likely to re-enter your property and, and picking them up with the baits um, as they come onto the place and, and well before there are lambs on the ground that distract them from taking the baits that you've got there. Um, points or locations to look at are, you know, obviously isolated water points, um, you know, small dams and things that are tucked into the bush or on the, the periphery of, of pasture, um, any vehicle tracks which provide easy travel ways, uh, uncleared bushland, um, any of those locations where you might have a, um, a pathway in terms of uncleared land or a creek line or something that moves from either you know, uncleared public land or, or adjoining neighbouring properties are all good places to, to look for putting these baits. Um, in terms of monitoring and uptake, you know, use baits like traps, I suggested there, tie them to the ground or bury them. Um, CPEs are also good for this, that they, don't, they can't just get shifted, they need to be physically eaten or chewed to get off that wire. And then replace those baits once a week, um, right up until you're lambing and even until after you finish lambing. Um, I'll make the comment there again, more is not necessarily better. Um, well positioned, um, targeted baits will get you more outcomes than, than throwing baits out randomly around the place hoping that something might pick it up. Um, the image there, for those that, that haven't seen it, that foxes are quite petite in the way that they take a bait out of the ground, they dig hand over or pour over pour and, and basically just pluck uh, baits out of the ground. When you're doing a baiting program where you've got foxes and dogs, um, that's a classic sign of how a, a fox takes a bait out of the ground. Dogs get down there on all fours and just dig the crap out of the hole and you've got you know, something that's been completely excavated. So you can still tell even when you don't have enough tracks around to, to tell what's actually taken the bait out of the ground. But I also highlight there that um, you know these kind of pet objectives which we'll talk about in a minute are ideal tools for this sort of an application in terms of replacement baiting. If we move to slide, uh, the next slide, 16, um, once again, very baiting techniques. You need to know where they are to replace them. So marking the sites is really important. Um, you can either use a GPS, um, that bucket of old ear tags that you've got in the shed, bit of metho to clean them up and a, a Nico pen and just number them and, and nail them to a tree or a star picket or, or a fence or whatever so you know where those baits are always going to be and you can come back to check them. You also know where they are so you can avoid those locations with your dogs. Um, tethering baits, as I said, is, is an ideal way to manage um, foxes taking more than one bait. Um, using the, monitoring the bait take using either sand pads or 
uh, looking at the way it's been removed so that you know, you know just what's been taking those baits. Um, once again, I highlight putting baits in spots where foxes should find them, um, targeting those corridors and, and bushland areas. And once again, if you can find those baits, going back and picking them up or covering them with a, um, a plow disc or something so your dogs can't get them before you go and muster paddocks is important to, to make sure those dogs, your working dogs aren't at risk. And um, look, I'm a big advocate for training your dogs to use muzzles in, in paddocks where you've, you think there's a risk that a bait might be lying around. Um, and i um, been working on developing a video looking at um, using muzzles on working dogs with some of the prominent Kelpie breeders down in Victoria that will be out fairly soon. So um, there's some of the basic principles about baiting, um, but I want to talk more about uh, these canid pest ejectors because I'm not sure that people are very familiar with them in uh, areas of Victoria where we haven't got wild dogs. We've been trying to get these registered for wild dog manager purposes for a number of years. Um, we now have them registered, but I don't think they're being used as effectively as they could in, in areas with foxes. Um, they were developed in America for um, coyote control. Um, they've got a number of advantages, and I'll just go through these pretty quickly because I've got a slide next door that will give a better idea. But they basically have to be hammered into the ground, um, so they can't be shifted. So those concerns about foxes moving the bait to somewhere where you don't know where it is um, is removed. These animals, they just can't physically move them once you're in the ground. Um, there's a capsule inside the bait head which um, contains 1080 or PAP. It's sealed up, so it's not affected by rain or water. So if you do get a big um, downpour of rain on, on an ejector capsule, it's not going to bother it, whereas if you've got a, a 1080 bait in the ground with rain on it, it's going to basically leach it out and, and render it useless. Um, the other benefit of these things is you can use a, a range of different types of bait heads, so you can put different types of meat. Um, or lures on the head, which, you know, once again, mixing it up, shanding it up, and um, getting them interested in different things. Uh, they're easy to install and remove. They can be disarmed and removed when you muff the stock, and they can be put back in place. You don't need to check them as regularly as bait. So um, I think the regulations in Victoria says up to four weeks, but I'll be checking them once a week regardless just to see what's, you know, what's being taken and what sort of densities of foxes are still around. They're very target specific due to the trigger mechanism. They have to be pulled on vertically and it takes about two kilos of vertical force, which not too many animals do. A lot of animals tend to pull things from the side. Um, foxes and dogs are the two main animals that can pull vertically and about the only ones that can set it off. Um, they're easy to identify if the animal's taken, been triggered because you can see that the um, capsule's been released and the contents has been injected out. So you've got a pretty good idea that something's tugged on it. Uh, and you know if it's been set off that you've pretty much been had the poison basically ejected straight in their mouth. And they don't take up a lot of room on your ute. They're quite small, the capsules are quite small, so you only need a small red uh, lockable toolbox on the back of ute to cart around a few bait heads and um, you know, a hammer, a pair of pliers, um, and a few capsules. Um, the disadvantages are that, well, sorry, Go yeah, back a bit. Trials have shown that they're extremely effective on foxes, so um, we have no issues with foxes taking them. The only disadvantage is they will cost a little bit more for you to get started. They cost about 70 to 80 bucks for a unit, um, but they're a bit like traps. Once you've got one, as long as you maintain it, you'll have it forever and a day. So, what the hell are they? If we move on to page uh, slide, I keep saying page slide 18. So on the right hand side in that gentleman's hands is a device, is the ejector device once it's been fully put together. Um, above it is an image of when it's nailed into the ground and, and that's what you see exposed at the surface of the ground. Now if we start from left to right, we have those pliers which are um, the setting pliers. The next to the right is the ejector unit. That is actually the cocked mechanism that, that is released and, and flows up through those little pink capsules down the bottom uh, and squirts the poison up into their mouth. Um, the ground stake is what you actually hit into the ground and, and holds it into place. And then the image to the right there shows um, the ground stake that's been nailed in the ground, the way that the uh, ejector unit sits within the, um, the ground spike and then you screw the bait head on, which is that um, lure head up on the left hand corner. Uh, before you put a bit of meat on it and you screw that on and that's what attracts the animal to it. The trigger, if you look at the ejector unit with the trigger, that little wire trigger sits in the rebated um, section on that piston. Uh, 
and holds that piston down and you can see on the ground spike there's a trigger slot you slide that unit into that slot you move that locking ring around it to hold it in place and then as the piston is the bait head is pulled up um, it catches on that trigger unit the trigger unit is pulled down that releases the piston and the piston moves up through the um, through the capsule and ejects the contents into its mouth. And if you go to slide 19, this is a fairly good representation of what happens. So as you can see there on the left, ground spike, everything's been nailed into position. There's a bait on the bait holder, capsules in place. That's the oranges with the contents of the capsule. Um, this fox, which in this case must be a miniature fox, as he's got a tiny head compared to that bait head, um, he puts his mouth or jaws around and over the top of that hole. Um, he tugs on the bait vertically and you can see the arrows. Once he does that, the trigger unit releases. The piston, as you can see, the spring fires the piston. The piston goes up through that capsule and ejects the contents of that poison, uh, the capsule, which is the poison, into the animal's mouth. Um, it's that simple. And I've got a video link there. There's a very good video that we developed that, that shows quite clearly how to use these devices, what they are, how they, what they consist of. Uh, and how to maintain them in, in good working order for, for fox and dog control programs. If we move to slide 20, um, yeah, this is just a, a bit of a, I guess, representation of, of some of the things we've been doing with landholders. Um, we're big on running field days around the country and giving people, um, you know, the examples and, and giving them a hands-on try at these devices so they can see how to use them, give them the confidence to, to use something new. Um, this is a number of photos here that show uh, how they're knocked into the ground um, using the pliers there in the first photo on the top level. Um, you can use a, a piece of Rio bar or a um, half inch bolt to slide down the inside of the ground stake and then you nail that into the soil. Um, and you need to do that because you can't afford to damage the top of the ground spike where the locking ring is. If that locking ring isn't mobile and can't be moved around, then you, you can't, can't lock the device in place and set the trigger. So we always use, and I'm sorry for the photos being quite small, but we always use a bit of Rio bar just to, to knock that into the ground. Um, you can see the next slide where we've sort of got the ground spike in there and you move along and you can see this gentleman uh, sliding the the, um, the ejector unit into the ground spike. Um, people often say to me, you know, well, what happens if it goes off um, when you're screwing the bait head on? Um, I always say to them, treat it like a firearm, um, treat the, the, the hole at the end of that just like the end of the battle on a rifle or a gun and keep it pointed away from you. As long as it's pointed away from you, um, if the piston goes off, then the contents get sprayed away from you. Um, not that I've pulled the trigger on a gun when I don't want to very often, but if it ever happened, you'd want to hope that you're pointing it in the right direction. So just keep that in mind. Um, the bottom photos there are examples of different types of bait heads. Um, you see there, our oh, mate's got a bottle of Aquavir glue. He's putting glue around um, a bit of soaker hose on the top of that bait head and then rolling it around in crushed liver treats, you know, the dehydrated uh, liver treats you get for your dogs. Um, rolling that around in the, the liver treats and then that results in a nice, um, I guess, liver, liver crumb bait head um, which foxes find irresistible. Um, foxes have got exceptionally good noses and, and because of their scavenging uh, behaviours are, are really good at finding things so you know anything you can use that encourages them to come to those uh, bait heads is, is important. Uh, and similarly, I didn't really mention it earlier, but um, putting additives on your baits like blood and bone and things like that uh, can also increase your bait uptake, particularly if you're burying baits. Um, guys that I know often use liquid blood and bone in a the old master food sauce bottle and, and just put a dollop of um, blood and bone on the bait before they flick the soil back over. Uh, and you don't need a lot, but it's often enough just to encourage extra uh, uptake from your baits. Um, and then on the right hand side here is um, the last photo on the right is the bait uh, bait head which is a dry meat bait that you can uh, buy commercially from uh, Animal Control Technologies. You can see there it's got the cap, that, that one hasn't been set off yet, it's got the, the white cap there at the top of the hole on the bait head and it's just sitting above the dirt 
just waiting for something to come along, put its head over the top and, and pull on the top of that. Um, if we move to page 21, um, a fair bit of writing on this and I do apologise, but um, the link down the bottom is a wild dog and fox baiting guide um, that I can send people if they're interested in one um, via Joe and if you contact me through the um, at the end of the presentation, I'm, I'm happy to send a few of these. These maps just sort of try and indicate areas that you know are worthwhile trying in terms of fox management, uh, locations where you consider putting baits at the five to ten per hundred kilometer, hundred square hectares. Sorry, um, this is in a, a cropping situation. You know, you've got um, fallow crops there with a bit of grass in between and, and some uncleared low scrub. You know, once again, isolated dams in those blue areas, uh, away from habitation, away from the homesteads. Um, where they can get a drink without being seen, um, the tracks that, that travel between uh, cropping areas on those little drainage lines and, um, and gutters, you know, allows them to move through those paddocks without being seen pretty easily. Uh, junctions of tracks are also very good locations. Foxes and dogs will, will mark areas um, with urine or, or they'll take a dump in those places so that animals know that they're around. And something we work on from a dog trapping perspective, if you Think about the wind direction um, at night. Most areas have sort of a prominent wind direction at, at a night during the night time. Try and put your baits on the upward side of your tracks from where that wind is going to be. So if an animal moves down a pathway, um, you know, it's going to have the centre of that bait blown towards it rather than being on the, the downward side of the wind and, and the smell gets blown out into the paddock instead of in front of its nose. That's something to consider um, if you're using baits on tracks in particular. Um, when you're moving into, I guess, more timbered country, and, and this area here uh, is up on the Upper Murray River. Um, unfortunately, it's probably burnt now, but um, it's up near Bowery Walwa. This is a, an area that's got wild dogs and foxes in it. Um, they both use the same locations and don't get sucked into the rubbish that foxes or dogs exclude foxes and cats out of bushland and native environments because um, we've got plenty of video footage of dogs walking up and, and uh, cocking their leg on a tussock only to have a fox come back an hour, half an hour later do the same uh, and then a big old tomcat come back and do it an hour after he's left. So they avoid each other in space um, and time but certainly don't exclude each other from these habitats. So in this case here, um, the red stars uh, are areas that are ideal for pacing baits. They're on um, once again, they're in um, property tracks that are you know, right on the periphery of, of open country in, on the edge of the bushland. Um, uh, the star, the second star um, on the left there, right down the bottom, there's actually a little dam tucked in there. So it's a, once again another ideal spot where animals can come out of that bush uh, and water without being seen or, and be quite you know, unaware of their presence. Uh, anywhere along the periphery of that timbered country there on the left hand side and then I've got some of those um, fire trails and tracks that go up on the ridge lines of those areas uh, where foxes and dogs are likely to use. Um, from a management perspective in terms of corridors, these animals are going to use the easiest pathways they can from, to get from point A to point B. Um, and that's why in these timbered country and bushland areas we always target tracks and fire trails first, particularly on ridges. Um, open bony ridges are generally where you find a fire track and, and you'll see that the animals and and all your wildlife are using those same locations. So once again, no need to put out heaps of baits, but target those areas the best of your ability. Um, down at the bottom there, those purple um, triangles there, you know, once again, they're the sorts of locations where isolated patches of timber on, on clear property where you know, foxes might find a den site underneath a fallen tree or something. They've got easy access to water, um, lambs potentially. Uh, rabbits and, and hares in that open country, so they're going to, you know, habitat those, ha inhabit those areas quite well. So, and then I've just got some yellow lines where you might consider putting uh, control in place if you've got animals coming up off the river there and moving into your property as, after you do your baby program. So, just thinking, you know, in, in terms of those landscapes, and, and I'm sure, I'm hoping that most of you guys are thinking seriously at the moment of it all. You know, there's a, a, a creek line that goes from Joe Blow's place next door that come into my place, or um, like my mate down around Balan there, it's got the Moorable River that runs through his joint, and, and that's the super highway for foxes. So, 
Uh, he's got 40 ejectors that he keeps on the river at all times. Um, so if anything strolls along the river into his place, it's got to get past 20 ejectors before it gets out the other side. Um, they're the sorts of things that you need to start thinking about in terms of this six to eight week replacement period uh, baiting program. And, and that's, I think, probably going to be the best way to reduce the numbers of those foxes um, across the landscape. Um, if we go to the next slide, number 23, um, I've just got some other key times to bait here. And, and this is something to consider um, that's not necessarily um, related to your management practices or your production uh, systems, but it's when foxes are particularly vulnerable to um, control and, and particularly baits. Um, late spring, early summer is when young foxes are moving uh, out of home. They're getting kicked out of home, so uh, odds are they're, you know, they're, they're probably pre pretty hungry. They haven't got mum there to hunt for them, so um, they're going to be relatively naive. It's the sort of time of year that you shoot foxes in really strange places, like walking up the driveway towards the homestead. Um, yeah, they're good times to try and put baits out, even if you're not a spring lammer. Um, keeping the densities of foxes down on your place all year round means you've got less to worry about when you when you're lambing in springtime. So keep that in mind that you know, that that early that spring early summer period with those young dumb foxes is a good time to take a few out. Um, the other thing that's sort of evolved in the last probably you know 20, 20 years. Um, Khaleesi virus and, and Mixos had a re-emergence re in some places, but when those rabbit populations reach large densities and, and get to critical mass and, and uh, Khaleesi virus runs through them and wipes them out in a few days, um, the foxes in that location have, have basically lost a food source overnight. And within a week, they're going to have not too many carcasses left to feed on, uh, and they're going to be pretty desperate for something to chew on. So, um, you know, if you've got you know, rabbits on your plants and you notice that they're, they're dropping like flies through Khaleesi virus, you know, it's a really good opportunity to, to um, reload your bait stations uh, and try and pick up some foxes when they're, you know, susceptible to picking up a bait because there's not much food about for them. The other thing that, that we do quite often, particularly with dogs, um, foxes and dogs uh, really enjoy um, broken earth. So if you're, if you're doing any fire trails or um, grading any um, property tracks, it's a really good opportunity to, to chuck some baits out uh, in the road reels on the side of those because they'll be moving up and down looking for any um, skinks or lizards or grubs or anything you've turned up with the fresh soil. So that's another opportunity. Um, I see we're getting close to time, guys, so I'll keep moving along. But monitoring is important. Um, monitoring tracks, sandy locations, road tracks, you know, keeping an eye on what's about is, is important in terms of that control periods. Um, we now have remote cameras and, and there's a lot of uh, advice and guides on, on that YouTube site as well as on the CRC PestSmart site on how to set up those cameras to give you an idea of what's around but also to look at what's taking baits and, and that photo down on the left there on a bait station uh, and the two foxes in the screen there at the bottom um, are taking baits out of a, fox, out of a, um, a dog baiting location in Victoria. So yeah, you can use those tools. Um, we've also developed a, a mobile app that allows us to um, record uh, activity and um, the Feral Scan website has a fox scan unit and this is what you see from the public. These are all sightings of foxes. But what you can do is um, download the app which then allows you to record information like your baiting program every time you place a bait. If you enter that control button, it gives you a GPS location, it tells you what you're doing. Uh, and then you submit it. And what it does is allows you to actually map where you put baits out on your property. Um, and this is actually one of my wild dog coordinators from Northern Victoria. And um, he's actually put baits out on his property and realised that he actually doesn't have a lot of baits where his landing paddocks are. So it just gives you the opportunity to have a look uh, at where you're actually putting your baits in terms of effectiveness. Uh, look, these are just some summary, um, some summary slides here about baiting programs and 1080. Um, coordinated programs are ideal if you can get your neighbours working with you. Uh, but seasonal asset protection and, and replacement baiting programs I think are still effective. So anyway, I will probably leave it there. Um, leave it with the last summary slide and um, take any questions that you might have. Thanks Greg, that's Thank fantastic. You, Thank you.
We'll now open up uh, the webinar for questions. I'll ask our assistant Luke to explain the process for placing your questions into the queue. Over to you, Luke. You there, Luke? While we're waiting for Luke, we might actually just move to perhaps some of the questions that have come in um, via uh, the webinar, those those hooked in through the webinar, not the phone. So Greg, if you can hear me, um, one of the questions asked by Jenny, she was wondering if the CPEs are actually available in Western Australia? Uh, yes, they are. Um, you'll have to look at what the requirements are over there to access them. There's probably some training involved, but um, they're readily available to my knowledge through your um, rural outlets. Uh, you just need to go and ask them. They may need to get them in, but um, Animal Control Technologies is the company that distributes them and um, they've got a number of retail outlets in WA. I know that for a fact. Okay. And next question from Kaylee is, if a predator picks up a PAP, bait but doesn't reach 80% saturation and recovers, does this animal then build up resistance? No, it doesn't. Um, because the, the toxin, the way it works in, in terms of binding red blood cells, there's no mechanism for resistance to occur. Um, as you can imagine, anything that affects our red blood cells, we're going to have some sort of a mechanism uh, or metabolism to try and manage that. And there are a number of enzymes that um, reverse the poison. Um, if, if they don't receive a full dose. So that's why it's important that they get a full dose to, to cause mortality. But there's no actual mechanism to build resistance to it. So no, um, that won't happen with this product. Okay, and yeah. perhaps just a couple of questions that I had myself, Greg. Um, I was pretty interested to hear in regards to the effective control. So you mentioned um, five to 10 baits per 100 hectares. Has that always mm -hmm. been the recommendation or is that something that's been adjusted over time after seeing how effective, effective the control has been? Yeah, I, I, the original um, densities I think were, were probably a little bit underdone. Um, but we, we've done research in the, you know, uh, I suppose the last 10 to 15 years to come up with those, those um, densities per hectare. So, Five to ten, I think we've had more knowledge now with new technology and radio tracking, um, all those sorts of um, research tools that have allowed us to get a better understanding of densities. And then we've also had cameras on bait sites and things like that to look at uptake. So um, yeah, five to ten is, is I guess, a, a recommendation that we've come up with more recently, um, particularly for fox management. Okay. And look, we did have a question from Don in regards to whether the webinar will be, a recording of the webinar will be available. Um, unfortunately, he was a little bit late joining us, but yes, it will be available, um, Don, um, in regards to the recorded webinar and a transcript associated with it. Uh, one last question, Greg, I had too was, bait depth, not the PAP devices, but normal baits, what, what depth should, we be, should they be buried? Uh, look, I think in Victoria it's down to five to ten centimetres. I think they they will be under the directions of use. Um, and look, I've seen you know foxes are quite adept at, at identifying where baits are you know, at that depth without any problem whatsoever. So um, look, you'd have to double check that. It, it, unfortunately, um, you work across the country; it varies in every state. So um, just refer to the directions for use that it's on that uh, link I put on that slide. And, and that'll give you the, the, um, the correct depth. Fantastic. So we might just try again um, and see whether or not uh, it's available to explain the process for those that have phoned in for placing their questions into, into the queue. Luke, how are we going? Sure. Thanks, Greg, and thanks, Joe. Um, for those of you who are on the phone, if you'd like to ask a question, you can do so now by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. We'll pause a moment to assemble a question queue. For those of you on the phone, just a reminder, it's star one on your telephone keypad. We don't appear to be having any questions coming through over the phone, so back through to you, Joe. Uh, 
Thanks very much, Luke. Uh, that concludes our webinar this evening. Uh, thanks again to our presenter, Greg. For those of you on the webinar platform, you'll be migrated directly to a short survey. Please take the time to fill this out as it allows us to provide you with timely information alternatively. Um, if you are joining us by phone, um, an email will be sent to you shortly um, and there will be a link to a survey associated with this. And as I mentioned before, um, a transcript of the presentation will be available on the registration portal in the coming days. Um, alternatively, a link will be provided to the registered emails which will direct you to the recorded webinar and to the transcript. Um, so thank you, Greg. Uh, appreciate your um, fantastic presentation tonight. Um, no I'd like to thank, you, thank everyone for their participation and um, wish you a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.